So why don't we go ahead and get started, Gary? Okay, good. Okay, it's being recorded. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for participating in today's Sandag Military Working Group of October 25th, 2021. Uh, before we begin the meeting, I'd like to ask Jennifer Williamson, who's been kind enough to serve as our clerk today for uh, this meeting. Uh, Jennifer, can you confirm that we do have a quorum? Yes, Gary, uh, we do have a quorum, so I believe we can go ahead and get started. Okay, so I'd like to review the process for both uh, the working group members, as well as members of the public who wish to speak under public comment. For working group members uh, who would like to speak, please click the raise hand icon in, in the Zoom control panel. Uh, you have control of your video and mute, so please turn on your camera when you'd like to speak, and I will call on you. Uh, if I don't, if I miss you, Jennifer, please interrupt me and make sure that I'm, I'm getting people's uh, attention, I'm aware of people's attention. Uh, do we have any questions before we continue? Okay, Jennifer, can you provide a quick reminder on how uh, the public uh, comments, comments will work today during today's meeting? Absolutely. So as noted on the cover page of today's meeting agenda, in addition to emailed comments, the public may also provide live comments during today's meeting. To provide a live verbal comment during the meeting, please join the Zoom meeting either by phone or computer. At the time for public comments, members of the public are asked to raise hand if you want to provide comments. The raise hand feature can be found on the Zoom toolbar, which is at the bottom of your screen. For those who are joining via computer, or by star nine for those that are joining by telephone only. The chair will call on members of the public by name of those joining via computer and by the last three digits of your telephone number for those joining via telephone. All comments received prior to the close of meeting will be made part of the meeting record. The instructions for providing live comments also are on the bottom of the cover page of today's agenda which can be accessed from the homepage of Sandeg's website at www.sandeg.org. So Chair Benelli, I think we're ready to get started. Thank you, Jennifer. Okay, uh, we're on item number one, welcome and introductions. Uh, it's been about six months since this particular working group has met. So I'd like to take this opportunity for the working group members that we can go around and uh, if you could introduce yourselves again to everyone else, because there might be some new folks and not only yourself, but uh, what area you represent, whether it's a military facility or installation or a, or a particular community or city. So if you could sort of chime in as, as, as possible. Anybody, don't be afraid. First person up. I, I can oh. jump in, uh, Mr. Chair. Good morning. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Tina Friend. I'm with the city of Coronado. I'm the new city manager. Delighted to be here. I've been here maybe five or six weeks and just really excited to join the team about the issues. And I know I'm the primary. I have to designate an alternate appointment as well. I'll be doing that. But in the meantime, I'd like to be here myself in person as much as I can. So very nice to meet you all. Welcome, Tina. Welcome to Coronado. Thank you. Hi, Rich Whipple from County of San Diego, uh, Department of Public Works, um, and former Navy veteran. So um, I have some friends still in the NAVFAC realm. Thank you for your service. Hi, I'm Jim Gurney. I'm the uh, Community Liaison Officer at Marine Corps Recruit Depot San Diego. Uh, I'm new to the job and new to this working group, but happy to be here. Good morning, good. everyone. My name is Mr. Laik, and I'm the Community Planning Liaison Officer for Naval Base Point Loma. And today I am sitting in for Steve Chung, who is the Navy Region Southwest Encroachment Program Manager. Thank you. Good morning. This is uh, Jeff Hunt. I'm the city planner for the city of Oceanside. And um, the alternate is Russ Cunningham and he will be taking over for the next meeting. I'm retiring in December after 32 years in community planning. So it's been a, a pleasure to be part of this uh, committee and uh, we look forward to Russ continuing Oceanside's participation. Thank you. Congratulations on your retirement and thank you for your public service. 
morning, Admiral. Hey, good. This is Sandy Hall from the city of Imperial Beach. Um, and I have with me also our assistant city manager, uh, Erica Cortez. We were not put in as panelists, but I was just promoted. So I received a promotion already this week. So this is going to be a fantastic week, Monday morning, and I've been promoted already. So it's good to be with everyone. Well deserved, Andy. Thanks for joining us. Hey, good morning. This is JJ Gamlin with Marine Corps Installations West uh, here at Camp Pendleton. I'm the uh, Deputy Director for Government and External Affairs uh, and support the region uh, writ large um, uh, and, and also this body. Morning, JJ. I think that's everybody, right, Jennifer? Yes, I was kind of looking down the participant list. I think the rest are Sandeg staff here for presentations. Okay, uh, we're at that point in most uh, public meetings now where I invite the public uh, for non-agenda items. Is there any uh, member of the public who, who wants to speak to the working group for anything that's not on the agenda today? Uh, you have three minutes. Do you see any hands, Jennifer? I do not. Okay, give me a second. Okay, we're down to item number two, which is approval of the meeting minutes of April the 12th. Um, do I have a motion to approve the uh, minutes of April the 12th? Don't be shy. So moved. Okay, there's a motion. Is there a second? Yeah, and JJ seconds. Okay. Um, all, the, uh, all those members that approve, say aye, please. Aye. Aye. Okay. Aye. Are there, are there any no's or uh, corrections? Done hearing none, the uh, April 12th uh, minute meetings are approved. And um, if I can, Mr. Chair, I'd just like to register an abstention just because I was not with the city of Coronado in April and did not attend the meeting. So I'd just like to abstain from this vote. I understand, Ms. Friend. Okay, you're you're abstaining. Thank you. Okay. Uh, okay, we're at the point now. Okay, uh, by chance, is there any uh, public comment on our minutes? I don't think so. Okay, uh, down to item number. Item number four. Okay, it's me, Chancellor Board. Okay, a couple of things. It's been six months, so. Some of this might be new to some folks, some of it might be old hat. Um, but in June of this year, Sandag and the Metropolitan Transit System unveiled the future uh, Veterans Administration Medical Center Trolley Station, one of nine new stations that make up the 11 mile mid coast extension of the UC San Diego Blue Line Trolley. That's the trolley that's going from uh, uh, essentially uh, uh, downtown up to the campus on UCSD. Uh, the event marked a milestone for the Mid Coast Project and celebrated the significance of, of the special station. When the trolley extension begins service, actually next month, uh, the VA Medical Center Trolley Station will provide veterans, patients, and medical staff from across our region with a new and convenient transit option for accessing the VA Medical Center. Sandag worked well closely with MTS and the San Diego VA Healthcare System to make sure this station would honor those who served. The station features uh, several unique design elements that pay tribute to veterans of the US military, one of our region's nationally most deserving communities. The Mid Coast Trolley Extension is one of the largest transportation infrastructure projects in our region's history, connecting residents, including vulnerable populations, to quality jobs and economic opportunities, schools, medical centers, and cross-border opportunities. This successful project is a testament to Sandag and Sandag's partners to plan, construct, and deliver large-scale projects on, on, on time and on budget. I think the total budget was around 2.1 billion, that's with a B, billion dollars. Uh, this is a major regional transportation investment that was long in the planning that Sandedge worked on long and hard and with the cooperation of our partners, it's becoming a reality. Uh, the Mid Coast Trolley Extension is an example of the long standing transportation solutions uh, we can achieve by working together. We invite everybody to uh, the opening of the Mid Coast Trolley entire line 
right now scheduled for the 21st of November. Please save the date and stay tuned for more details. Um, switching subjects here to border reopening. Uh, I want to start by acknowledging the actions of the President Biden and his administration in taking the uh, non-essential cross-border travel restrictions at our international border with our neighbors to the south of Mexico starting in November. So that restriction will be lifted. Fully vaccinated foreign nationals will now be able to enter the U.S. with proof of vaccination. Throughout the pandemic, thousands of U.S. citizens, residents, and essential workers continue to cross the border every day. But this, is but this has been nearly 19 month closure has affected thousands of lives, including the regional economy, especially along the border, business closures, and most of all families. This is great news for our border region. Again, switching uh, uh, subjects, uh, a quote from Steve Jobs, if you're working on something exciting that you really care about, you don't have to be pushed. So this vision pulls you. The Sandag team is working hard uh, to release a request for innovative concepts in the next few weeks. We are anticipating releasing this request for innovative concepts in November, and the first round of proposals will be due in January. Jennifer, give, give me some color on this, because, okay, what, what exactly is Sandag looking for in, quote, innovative concepts? Yeah, so this is a really exciting thing that's um, being prompted by the regional vision, which you have all heard a lot about. And essentially what it is, is we're looking for a public-private partnership with um, and a, a company or a, a vendor that can provide a, it could be an autonomous type vehicle shuttle. It could be a connected vehicle service. Essentially what we're looking for is the ability to deliver a project in a shortened time frame. A lot of our CIP projects, our capital projects take quite a bit of time to deliver. So we're looking for an innovative method of delivery. We're looking at an innovative option for the actual service itself. And we've provided, or we will be providing, it goes out on November 1st, a uh, description of all of our hotspots or problem areas in the region. And we're looking for solutions on how we might provide transportation services to those areas. Is, so look for it on November 1st, we'll have it coming out. Thank you, okay. Um, also, um, as part of the Sandex transportation planning process, they're looking at their 2021 uh, regional transportation improvement program. Um, in order to meet the goals outlined in their, in their working on their 2021 regional plan and ensure an alignment with state and federal priorities, Sandex will need to adjust and update their capital budget. Uh, to that end, uh, Sandag will bring a budget before their board of directors, uh, I guess, later in November as a part of the regional plan, regional transportation improvement uh, program early next year. Uh, we're working through the details. We'll provide an update uh, soon. So the RTP is sort of, you can look at it as a subset of the overall uh, uh, regional plan to uh, update major transportation infrastructure. Okay, now before I go to the Central Mobility Hub, are there any public comments on uh, my, my chair's report? Any, any, any comments at all from the public? Are there any comments from the uh, working group members? Okay, we'll get right into the Central Mobility Hub. I think we have Ryan Kohut with us. Uh, Ryan will talk about uh, how Sandex working with the Navy on the potential for a central mobility hub. Uh, Ryan, don't take anything for granted. We got a lot of new people. So if you can, don't assume anything, have at it and give us a, a general update on what's going on. Sounds good. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm going to try to bring up a PowerPoint presentation here. Um, I think many of you have already seen it, but like you said, Chair, uh, I think it's been a while and, and um, I'll, I'll go through this quickly but um, kind of share where we've been. Let's see here. There we go. Um, yeah, thank you everybody. Um, yeah, I'm just gonna give you a brief update of where we are in the Central Mobility Hub. Um, for those of you who haven't uh, heard this before, um, you know, and like Jennifer was saying, we're, we're pushing through the, uh, the new 2021 uh, Sandag Regional Plan. 
Um, one of the five big moves that you've heard so much about is mobility hubs. And what we're talking about here is uh, the creation of a central mobility hub that really ties together all the, um, the methods and modes of transportation, whether that be road or rail, uh, both commuter and kind of regional rail, Amtrak, um, along with bicycles, pedestrians, all of your micro mobility solutions, all into one place where that mode shift can happen and um, connecting the San Diego region to, um, you know, for the first time to the San Diego International Airport. Uh, San Diego is the largest airport in the country without a direct uh, fixed, uh, uh, fixed rail connection to its airport. And um, we be believe that that's something that's uh, really important both for the future of uh, you know, transit in San Diego, but to also really bring that access to the airport to you know, um, uh, commensurate with cities of our size and, and allow for that growth um, in transportation and uh, economically. Um, what we're really trying to do is, is connect the airport to the region. Um, and you know, it's something that's been talked about for a long time um, you can see here, you know, the airport passes by all sorts of major um, regional transportation assets. I-5 goes right by the airport. Um, the existing uh, trolley and uh, regional rails pass by the airport. You can see it, but you can't go there. And that's something that we're trying to fix. Um, we're looking at multiple locations for a central mobility hub, um, one of which is the Navy's Old Town Campus. Um, the Navy is looking to redevelop their uh, Old Town campus, which is currently the home for the NAVWAR command. Um, and we are uh, working with the Navy to see if we can partner and locate our mobility hub on their property as part of their project. We're also looking at the possibility of a central mobility hub at the Intermodal Transportation Center, which you can see on blue uh, lower and to the right on this map. And then um, we're also looking at some other alternatives that we're uh, kicking around to see if they might be possibilities. Um, the Navy's Old Town Campus Revitalization Project. Many of you have probably already heard about this. Um, NAVWAR currently sits on a, on a site, 70 and a half acre site just west of I-5, north of downtown. Um, this site uh, and their facilities sit inside a World War II era. It's actually a former B-24 factory. Um, this is the Navy's uh, artificial intelligence, cyber warfare, and information technology support uh, functions, and they need a new home. Um, when it rains, the, the rain comes through the roof right into their facility, um, and they are, um, you know, seeking to improve that and really get into new facilities that are appropriate for their mission. Um, right now, they are considering five potential alternatives to redevelop that site with a general idea that they have 70 and a half acres of land. They want to find a developer who's willing to take on the redevelopment of the site in return for a commitment by that um, party to build the Navy a new NAVWAR facility. You know, take all of our extra land, go ahead and develop it, build us a new military facility so we can do our mission. What Sandag has been talking to the Navy about is, you know, why don't you give us a corner of that, let us build our mobility hub, and then not only do we bring transportation connectivity to the site, but we bring a reason for those developers to value that Navy land higher, allow the Navy to, um, to get more dollars from its development rights that can be translated into more military facility. Um, Sandag and the Navy have now executed two agreements with the Secretary of the Navy and, and what we're doing right now is just kind of partnering together to figure out how that might work. Is this something that's doable? Can we both get what we need out of that kind of arrangement? And um, is it something we should move forward with? Um, right now, um, the Central Mobility Hub itself, our, the Sandag project, we went out to uh, the public with a notice of preparation to begin a CEQA document on the Central Mobility Hub back in April. As part of that process, we um, asked for um, public comment and, and received a lot of information from the public on what they might want out of the Central Mobility Hub. 
Um, right now, we are in the process of, of really getting into those comments, looking at them. Actually, you know, to be honest, they brought up a lot of really interesting ideas. And um, we're doing the hard work of running some of those ideas down and seeing how they really um, you know, change the way we look at what we want to do with our project. Um, we are also um, initiating technical and feasibility studies um, to really look at uh, you know, what the mobility hub does, how it should be structured, what are the potential impacts it may generate. And so we're doing our homework right now with the goal of coming back with a draft environmental impact report sometime towards the end of next year, beginning of 23, where we would then go through another public review process, um, all with the goal of getting a, a fully cleared central mobility hub project somewhere towards the middle end of 23. Um, we also are going to need to initiate a federal uh, NEPA process um, we are working with the um, pretty much all of the possible federal agencies that could get involved with a project right now. Um, the, you know, we have an airport, we have highways, we have a heavy rail. So we're talking to um, the Federal Rail Administration, the Federal Transit Administration, Federal Highways, the FAA, really trying to sort out the details of what our project is and getting all of them involved in understanding what we're trying to do. And then we're gonna be looking to identify a federal lead agency and initiate a, a federal NEPA document later this year. Um, we're also uh, uh, looking at it at, this, at the Central Mobility Hub and through the lens of the um, uh, uh, comprehensive multimodal corridor plans and really looking at not just the project itself of what a Central Mobility Hub is, but how does that operate on a larger scale? How does that fit as a piece within the regional transportation network? And how does it enable and, and really effectuate the five big moves that we're uh, trying to explain to the entire region? And so as part of that, we're looking at how this project can, can really get in and further these goals. How do we look for those active transportation micromobility options? How is this going to impact the economic development of the region? the movement of goods? How is it going to uh, effectuate our environmental policy goals of uh, vehicle miles, travel reductions, greenhouse gases, air quality? Um, you know, is this gonna create jobs and where? Can this project at, in, in a larger scale really improve the supply of housing, especially affordable housing in the region? And so, um, you know, we've been developing some concepts of what what a central mobility hub would look like, both you know on the Navy's uh, uh, Old Town campus and at our alter alternatives, and we're really starting to put together some ideas of what this will look like. And in the future, we'll hope to be sharing a lot more of this with the public. Um, here's an interactive map, just kind of showing you know how we're looking at this from a regional uh, perspective, how this investment in one project in one location can provide benefits you know, miles away from where we end, we end up putting the eventual project and how it ties into the existing and future infrastructure that we're planning. Um, and again, we're, we're, just, we're really looking to use this as an opportunity to pull things together and to um, act as a linchpin and a, a, you know, a corner, uh, cornerstone to tie together all of our regional uh, priorities. Um, including complete quarters. This is a this is just a timeline showing uh, kind of where we are when we were developing the environmental process. Um, you know the notice of preparation and all of the public outreach that we're doing, and then um, you know we are uh, looking for. We're even though the public comment process is over, we're still looking for ideas, and if. Um, you or your constituents or anyone in the, in the community has anything that they wanna share with us, we will take any good idea that come along. So um, here's some contact information if, if you wanna um, provide additional comments or ideas. And so with there, I'll uh, take any questions. Okay, Ryan, what I'd like to do is, uh, Jennifer, if we can, after the meeting, uh, uh, that slideshow, if you can, if you could send that slideshow out to the, the working group members, uh, that, that'd be great just so they have it for their information. 
Um, just let me ask one question, then I'm going to go to the public, and then I'll go to the working group members. Um, and Chair Benelli, Ryan, if we can just interject real quickly, we're we're actually going to have Danny up next on the presentation, who's going to talk about the uh, comprehensive multimodal corridor plan that Ryan mentioned in his okay. previous presentation. Well, <laughs> if, if I can just, uh, I think Ryan kind of covered the you know the same exact slides I was I was about to, to cover. So I mean, there's a little bit of overlap. I'm here to, you know, if there's questions specifically on the uh, CMCP, I can address those. And uh, between Ryan and I, we can tag team any responses to questions. Thanks, Danny. Okay, let me, let me do this. Let me ask one question. I'm going to go to the public, then I'm going to go to the working group members. Uh, the question I have, Ryan, with the change in the relatively new Secretary of the Navy and the, his new key principles, especially the energy installations and environment uh, uh, secretary, um, have you sensed uh, uh, any any change in, uh, I, and I know this is a subjective question, any change in the attitude of the Navy uh, in regarding to the mobility hub in the Navy Old Town Complex? Um, I can say that uh, the Navy has, uh, you know, has continued to express support for, you know, um, the inclusion of the mobility hub on the Navy's OTC site. Assistant Secretary Berger has been confirmed a couple of months ago. I know she's still, um, you know, really looking around the country at all of the um, various initiatives and projects that are inside her purview. Um, but we, we've we been talking to both um, Navy Southwest here um, in San Diego, and we've been uh, coordinating with um, uh, NAFAC in DC and um, everything is, is pretty much the same as it was before. Um, we're all looking at each other's projects, trying to understand what we're trying to do and, and uh, looking for those opportunities to work together because we do think we can get more together working the San Diego region and the Navy together than either of us could do on our own. Okay, okay. Let me go to members of the public for this particular item here on the Central Mobility Hub, Navy Old Town Complex. Are there any members of the public who would like to address this item? Jennifer, do you see any hands? I do not. No hands, okay. no comments. We're having an easy morning this morning. Uh, any, uh, uh, from the working group members, anybody, any comments from the working group members or questions? Well, we're living large here. Let me, let me ask a question, uh, Jennifer and Ryan and Danny. Um, I, I'm assuming San Diego's working relatively closely with the city of San Diego as they look to uh, de redevelop the adjacent sports arena area and the, mid and, and the midway complex down there and how that all is going to piece together. Um, yeah, we've had multiple meetings with the city talking about what their plans are out there. Um, I know the city has a, um, a, a competitive process out on the street. Um, there are various developer, you know, consortiums trying to develop uh, proposals for what the city can do out there. Um, we at Sandag are looking for what we can do. We're, we're excited about the opportunity of the sports arena acting with the potential redevelopment of the Navy site to really activate that entire Midway area. And so what Sandag's doing is not only looking at the Central Mobility Hub, but looking at the opportunities to provide transit solutions, transportation solutions that can, you know, um, really activate, effectuate, and encourage um, development through that urban infill area and um, in the right way. And so um, even beyond CMH, we, we want to do everything we can to provide the transit and transportation backbone that can make that development work. Okay. Uh, Danny, Danny, do you have anything else you want to add? No, I think um, I think Ryan kind of covered all that coordination we're working with the city. But you know, on the planning side, you know, we're not just looking only at the individual side of where the Central Mobility Hub is. It's vitally important to make those connections, uh, not only through the region with regional transit, but into the communities, including sports arena. And we understand, you know, Midway Sports Arena area is is going to be completely revitalized and changed um, in the near future. And the Central Mobility Hub can be a piece of that to, you know, to, to help support that vision that the community has there. Okay. Uh, Region Southwest, you uh, have anything to add? Do you any, any, anything you'd like to amplify on Region Southwest? 
Thank you, Chair Vanelli. Uh, nothing uh, other than reiterate what Ryan said that yes, we have had uh, leadership uh, changes, but uh, when it comes to the OTC revitalization, we are staying the course still. They're working on the draft EIS and uh, uh, currently the final, hopefully when it comes out, it will move this process forward and uh, no additional changes at this time. Thank you. Wonderful, okay, thank you for that. Okay, last crack from the working group members. Anybody wanna comment on this item? Yeah, I, I do, uh, Mr. Benelli. Okay. Uh, if I could just ask a question. Thank you so much for that presentation, Ryan and Danny. Very interesting. And I'm hoping you can help me help me understand as a newer person to this area of work, the components of a central mobility hub. How does this differenti differentiate it from a transit stop? And do all of them operate the same way? So if you could provide maybe just a little bit more background for me to understand what, what this would look like and feel and how this provides that connection. And Danny, do you want to take that one? Yeah, so uh, if, I'm sorry, I didn't hear it all the way, but if I, I'm going to rephrase it and if, correct me if, if I'm answering the wrong question here. So you're, you're asking how the central mobility hub is different than any other transit station, basically, is that? Yeah, exactly, how it operates. Yeah. What are the features of it that make it a hub, a transportation hub as opposed yeah. to a, a transit stop? Like what are the, because I've heard various components. And so I just want to know, how would this one operate? And do they all kind of operate the same way across the system? Is that the system-wide model? Maybe, maybe excuse me, um, if I may, Chair Vanelli, Colleen. Hi, Clements Colleen, good here. morning. Hi. <laughs> so I would love the opportunity to respond to Tina's question, if I could. Okay. Um, so I think you're, Tina, you're somewhat familiar with what we've been talking about with the regional plan and the five big moves. And one of the five big moves are mobility hubs. And we have over 30 of them identified throughout the San Diego region. And each one is different depending on where it's located. And, and mobility hub, I think, is a difficult word because it sounds like it's a transit station and it's much more than that. It's really an area where there's multiple types of transportation that come together, but these are also activity centers in the region. There are employment centers in the region. These are the areas that are slated for future growth and development or are already activity centers today. So, you know, downtown San Diego, um, a central mobility hub, some of the things we're talking about would allow for a whole lot of new development if it happened at, at NAVWAR. Other places, you know, you might think of North Park or Hillcrest, where we'd be doing some infill development. It's not kind of starting from scratch, sort of a redevelopment kind of idea. Uh, another mobility hub is down at um, the San Ysidro Port of Entry. And that's much more of a transit station with surrounding supporting development, but we don't envision a whole lot of housing necessarily there. So hopefully that gives you a sense that they're not a one size fits all. The central mobility hub is where all the transportation will come together and probably provides a, one of the greater opportunities for new development and others are much smaller scale um, infield development type. So good question, thank you for that. Yeah, and that really helps, thank you, just to help um, provide that larger vision. Thanks, Colleen. Tina, any other questions right now? Okay. Gary, we do have another hand up, Jim Rooney. Okay. And just one quick question on the, uh, the the public comments. Can we get a, a, a characterization of what those comments were? Any significant concerns or uh, vocal support? Um, we received a lot of public comments on the Central Mobility Hub. Um, uh, a lot of them were focused on, you know, how do we better connect downtown? Um, uh, how do we, um, a, a lot of them were, you know, how do we work with the with the Navy's project and um, you know mitigate and handle the increased density proposed by the Navy? Um, a lot of bicycle and pedestrian um, related connectivity related comments. Um, so a lot of stuff we were expecting, but we're we're really digging into those and looking into how we can address them and incorporate those ideas into our overall project. Okay, thanks. Anything that, uh, just a quick follow-up, was there anything that you dug out of those things that, that, that impacted the way you're planning? Uh, have you had to add anything or, uh, or say, hey, maybe that's a, a bridge too far on, on any part of the project? 
Um, it, it's, it's nothing that we were shocked to see. And so um, we're, we're in that process right now. We're really trying to get in those, get into those comments and see how we can make our project better by incorporating them. And, and so um, I think in the next few months, uh, we'll be getting out trying to explain um, you know, how we're, we're accommodating our project to, to really make it better and address what everybody's asking for. Okay, thanks. Any other questions or comments? Okay, I'm down to the part now where I'm going to go on to item number seven. Uh, for those who don't know Colleen Clemenson, she's the director of planning. She's the guru of planning for SANDAG. So Colleen's gonna go over uh, sort of a, give us an update on Sandex five priority projects. Colleen, over to you. Thank you, Chairman. So um, there are five priority projects that Sandag has been working on for the last several years, and some of them are getting ready to wrap up, and we're getting to re ready to add a, add in some new ones. But um, first of all, I wanted to mention the Mid Coast Light Rail. So this is the extension of the San Diego trolley from Old Town up to UCSD. And we are scheduled to open that um, that system. We're, we're scheduled to open that um, route at the end of November. So we're just, you know, about six weeks away from opening. That will allow one seat ride between UCSD at <clears throat> the University Town Center Mall at, all the way down to the border. So really exciting, big project, biggest project in the region for decades and um, very proud that we'll be able to link um, really all of our major universities in the region once this this is complete. So that's first. Second, we're continuing to work on stabilizing the bluffs in Del Mar. I think everyone here knows the importance of the that rail corridor between San Diego and all the way up to San Luis Obispo known as the um, low sand corridor. So we have been fortunate to get a fair amount of funding from the state of California to help stabilize the bluffs. And at the same time, we're working on a plan to, to get the rail lines actually completely off the bluff. That's the long-term plan. So that's the second big project. Third, we're working on the third border crossing at Otay Mesa East. So making a lot of progress down there. We got a large um, federal grant to um, put in fiber and, and really advanced technology so that when that project comes online, we'll be able to take advantage of um, the latest technologies and how we allow that um, border crossing to function. And then you heard the update on the Central Mobility Hub from Ryan. So that is well underway. And then the big project, the big, big, big one that I'm so proud of is the regional plan and the five big moves. And the regional plan is scheduled to go to the board of directors on December 10th. Um, we, wrap, we wrapped up public review of the draft plan at the end of August. We released the environmental impact report. The environmental impact report comments have also been received. Um, we're compiling all of our responses to those comments. This Friday at the Board of Directors meeting, we'll be going through the public comments that were received on the plan and proposed changes from the draft plan to the final plan. So lots going on there. We're really excited about how the regional plan is shaping up. It's really setting forth a whole new um, way of thinking about our transportation future in the region and not only to serve us out to the year 2050, but generations beyond. So lots happening in the planning field. Um, other things that will be coming on the heels of that, we are working to implement the board of directors statement on equity. And the board last Friday um, took a bold action to advance funding to do some pilot projects around public transit. And so about $8 million to um, do greater levels of service on some of our highest used transit lines, also looking for to fund um, youth free youth passes um, for 18 and under. And these are both pilot projects to help um, some of our most disadvantaged communities. So some of that more to come on the horizon and thanks for the opportunity. Happy to answer any questions about that, Chairman. Okay. Uh, first of all, let me see, is there any uh, public comment? Anybody have public, any members of the public would like to ask Colleen a question? 
Okay, uh, working group members, any, any working group members, comments or questions of Colleen? So Colleen, if I understand, I'm not hearing any bells right now. If I understand, okay, so we're gonna uh, look this Friday, the 29th, uh, the board of directors are gonna see a, a summation uh, again of all the public comment and all the public outreach. Uh, that you guys have been doing, or what tweaks or adjustments to the regional plan are being made. And, uh, and then the next big milestone will be in December when they give it an up or down vote for the uh, uh, adopting the plan and certifying the programmatic EIR. Exactly. You are so astute, Chairman <laughs> Benelli. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. You, got, you hit it on the nose. Okay, so I'm not hearing anybody, so I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, Colleen and I have had long discussions and I've given this a, a lot of thought uh, from, from inside baseball, having worked with Sandag for the last 45 years. Um, I, if I look around that big table of, of Sandag representing the 18 cities in the county, and there's also 10, 10 advisory agencies, including the Department of Defense, um, when the voting members of Sandag vote on this plan in December, um, my inclination is that uh, the board will be split, but they'll vote to move the plan ahead. I've participated in a number of their public outreach events. And the two questions that Sandag astutely poses to the public is, you know, what do you like most about the plan? What don't you like about the plan? So I've given that a lot of thought. And uh, what I like, I think, most about the plan, uh, it is a planning process that happens every four or five years. If the board does, in fact, adopt this regional plan uh, that hopefully will guarantee the continued uh, funding, uh, streaming of federal and state funds into our region for transportation projects, programs, and, and services. Uh, what I don't like about the plan, and Colleen knows this, it's got $163 billion, $163 billion price tag over the next 30 years. It's a wonderful, wonderful vision. I salute Sandex staff for their sustainability element, for their equity element, uh, really future thinking of trying to do with the, the big five moves, but I just don't think the region is going to buy it. And well, we'll see. The time, the time we'll see. I, I don't think it's a plan that can be implemented the way it's been currently laid out. But we'll see. And I'll, I'll make those comments at the, uh, on the 29th of October as a member of representing the port and the transportation committee. Uh, from my personal perspective from the port and for the South Bay cities in Coronado and Pearl Beach, uh, Chula Vista, South San Diego, where we've been working very closely on what we call Harbor Drive 2.0, which goes by Naval Base San Diego. That's going to be a wonderful multimodal corridor of, of transit, highway, uh, active transportation, walking and bicycle. I think it's going to, that's a great part of the plan. And the other one, actually, from my biased port perspective, is the ability to keep that north south rail line functioning along the coast until it gets moved inland because we move so much product north, north and south. We're not only talking, you know, talking about people movement, we're talking about goods movement. Um, okay, so I've given my little speech here. Anybody, uh, anybody on the working group would like to comment or other questions of Colleen? Okay, Colleen, we're getting off early, early this morning. On to our hopefully, um, uh, one of the last items is the San Diego Region Military uh, Installation Resilience Effort. So we'll go into uh, Anna. This is new to me. So Anna, fire away. Good morning, everyone. My name is Anna Lowe. And can you hear me okay? I should check that first. We're good. I can hear you, Anna. Perfect. Great. Um, and I'm actually going to, um, we have a team of folks here to chat with everybody this morning about all of the great work that we, Sandeg, are doing in conjunction with, um, with our Navy partners here in the region, as well as some of our other um, member agencies. Um, so what I'm actually going to do is kick it over to Zach first, and he's going to actually kick the, the, the presentation off, and then you guys get to just kind of bounce around with us. So thank you. Hi, working group, Golden Metal Working Members. Good morning. Uh, my name is Zachary Brat. I'm a regional planner here at Sandag. Uh, today I'm going to... Zach, can I interrupt you real quick? Can, are you able to share the slides in presentation mode so that folks can see them a little bigger? Is that possible? Oh, is it not doing that? 
No, we well, can just be, yeah, yeah, sorry. Thank you all for bearing with us. I think if I do this, it should work. Is that good now? Got it, Work, working for me. Awesome. Uh, so anyway, good morning, everyone. I'm gonna here with some members of our team to provide an update on the San Diego Region Military Installation Resilience Project, um, which was funded by the US Department of Defense, uh, which is the Office of Local Defense Community Cooperation uh, for the past year. Um, we're gonna talk about phase one, and we're also gonna give an overview of phase two, which were just recently awarded and started work on. And so um, just a brief overview of what we're gonna talk about today. We're gonna have an update on phase one, uh, which includes the goals in the project area, um, an overview of our outreach campaign, our resilience findings, and our data sharing framework. And then we're going to go a little bit into our next steps and talk about phase two, just the project goals and overview of what we're going to do for the next year, uh, and then the, the overview timeline. And so starting off with phase one, that's what we've been working on for the past year. So just as a recap, most of you have probably heard of most of this before. Um, but the grant goals for phase one were to assess climate resilience of the Navy installations within San Diego. Um, and we want to make sure that they're eligible to be considered within San Diego CMCP plans efforts. Um, second, we want to develop business processes and protocols for data and information sharing so that we get comprehensive and reliable data, uh, data sets between San Diego and the Navy. Uh, and third, we want to make sure we support um, sustaining Navy mission readiness and resilience in implementing our national defense strategy here in the San Diego region. And so as you've probably seen before, this is our focus area. Um, we're looking at three big naval bases within central San Diego. That's gonna be Coronado, Point Loma, and San Diego, which are highlighted on this map, as well as the surrounding communities, communities that support uh, these bases and kind of provide um, the neighborhoods in which they uh, work and the people there um, commute from. So now I'm gonna hand off to Gia to talk about our outreach and engagement strategy. Great, thank you, Zachary. Um, I'm Gia Balish with the Sandag Strategic Communication Team overseeing the communication and outreach effort uh, for this project. Uh, so a big part of this effort was working closely with Navy Region Southwest and specifically the bases that are um, within that project area Zachary just showed. We also worked closely with Caltrans and City of San Diego in this effort, um, but in working with the Navy, we identified the particular climate stressors that could impact the, um, I want to say functionality, but I think there's a more technical <laughs> military term, um, uh, uh, maintaining mission readiness. Um, so we wanted to make sure that, you know, we identified the climate stressors and the, the specific transportation facilities that would potentially impact mission readiness for those uh, naval bases. So we'll go over those findings momentarily, but it's important to note that while we were working on this with our partners, uh, we were going out to the community to ensure that they were aware of this effort, especially because it did uh, you know, it did somewhat touch upon the comprehensive multimodal corridor planning effort as well. So as you saw in that project study area, there is overlap with both the South Bay to Sorrento CMCP and the Central Mobility Hub CMCP. So in order to conduct effective public outreach, we did leverage those CMCP meetings wherever possible, uh, but we did also uh, conduct our own outreach going to several community planning groups and other um, local community um, meetings simply to, again, make sure they were aware of the effort and, um, and take notes on any feedback they had at that time, um, but most of our efforts were more focused on being informational in nature. And we did develop surveys um, with the hope of being able to distribute those in partnership with the Navy to their staff and personnel. Um, hopefully we'll be able to do that in phase two. Next slide, please, Zachary. Uh, so this is actually showing the findings. As I mentioned, we worked closely with the Navy and our partners to determine what those climate stressors were and also the transportation facilities that we would need to look at in more detail. Uh, so this is uh, this screenshot you see here, as well as this graph, this actually came from our first workshop with the Navy. Um, and again, really identifying those um, perceived top climate stressors. 
Um, I'll actually turn it over to Anna so she can speak in more detail to it, to what those are. Thank you. Thank you, Gia. So one of the nice things about working on this project is um, I, I know personally I got to work with a lot of folks that I may not have gotten to work with before. So um, I've, I've really gotten to know a lot of of our SANDAG folks, as well as a lot of folks at the Navy. Um, so that this has been a, kind of a fun project for everybody. Um, so based on a lot of the engagement that Gia had mentioned, we um, collectively had identified um, a number of priority, um, excuse me, sorry, uh, a number of regional, regionally prioritized facilities, both critical, as, as Gia mentioned, to uh, Navy mission readiness, as well as um, SANDAG transportation projects. And just to remind folks from, from the map that was shown uh, a few slides back, the particular Naval installations that fell into the project area were Navy Base Coronado, Navy Base San Diego, and Navy Base Point Loma. So what we've done here is created a table to identify some of those key transportation facilities that fall within the you know, general vicinity and that feed in or out of those particular bases. Um, so those you can see across the top there. Um, and then along the far left side, what you can see are um, the climate stressors specifically that were identified. Um, and, and there are more. I mean, I think that we can all ident identify a number of other potential impacts that um, are completely outside of our control, but moreover, you know, Mother Nature. Um, but, but focusing on those that were of most uh, critical um, to, the, to the Navy, to our transportation facilities, and um, that we really think will be, um, you know, being, that we will be facing um, in the very not too distant future. So on the far left side there, you can see there's coastal storm and storm surge. So, you know, that I think that we can all agree there that, that there's a lot of impacts that we've already been feeling from, from coastal storm and uh, storm surge. Um, and erosion, again, all of these pieces are tied together. Sea level rise specifically, so outside of those um, particular storm surge effort or um, impacts, and then flooding and tsunami as well. And so again, just trying to leverage a lot of the work at, um, and the concerns that have already been identified from, from the Navy's perspective, as well as there's been a lot of work that's been done with um, a lot of our member agencies that do um, uh, touch on the bay. So for example, the city of San Diego had prepared um, uh, a risk analysis as well. So we were able to really leverage a lot of research that's already been done. And then coordinating closely with the South Bay to Sorrento CMCP that has been had been also carrying um, a lot of the, the shoulder, shouldering a lot of the work there as it relates to some of the background research as well. So we were really able to leverage a lot of the work that's been going on. Um, and so really, again, you can see this kind of cross reference of where, you know, these, these priority areas, as well as um, identified stressors um, kind of converge. Um, and all of these pieces were integrated into a vulnerability assessment. And here's an example of um, just some, some mapping that was done as part of that vulnerability assessment. So here, this is um, in relation to, to sea level rise. Um, and and some and combined with um, storm events, a hundred year storm events. So really, you can kind of start to see exactly where the naval facilities are and where a lot of that flooding is very likely to occur. And so again, just kind of reiterating the real the real concern and the issues that we are all going to have to be working on together in order to kind of ensure that we can move people, goods, and are safe. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Rachel Cortez, who is going to share a little bit more about some of the other pieces of the work that we did in this phase one. Thanks, Anna. Yeah, so um, like Anna said and Zachary introduced, uh, one of the elements of this project was also to create a data sharing framework between SANDAG and the Navy. Um, 
This is, I work in the department at Sandag that creates uh, the population and housing estimates, um, estimates of jobs, the forecast and different um, data products that get used in, for research and also for the regional transportation plan. And one of the really obviously important elements of that, re, of that work is getting data on military employment, military personnel, the installations and the people living in and around um, naval installations in the region because it's just such a big part of the of the region and employment and the people living here. So in the past, we've had um, contacts at different installations that we would get in touch with to get that those data. Um, this is a works really well if people don't change jobs and everyone stays with the same email and phone number, which we all know doesn't happen. So. One of the things that we decided to undertake with this project is to just create um, what we're calling a data sharing framework, which would help enable SANDAG and the Navy to share data on an annual or maybe more than annual basis. So not just SANDAG going out to the Navy and collecting information, but also sharing data with the Navy once data are collected or different information that could also help help them um, help everyone in that in that capacity. So. The first phase of this project, we created an actual framework. We worked on it with um, the, our Navy partners and it um, describes the framework, the process. It has a data sharing, um, a data request template and also kind of outlines the needs for data sharing and why collaboration is so important. Um, so we were able to create an inventory of what we are currently needing and what we think we might be able to get in the future. We identified the different data sources um, we created an actual document that was part of the final report. And really now that this framework's in place, we're just looking forward in phase two to um, start putting it into action. And um, we've already started to use this framework to receive some data from the naval installations, but really working through that and seeing what other kind of products we can get and getting regular updates to the data that we need for, for research and planning. So that I'm handing it back, I think, to Zach? To Anna, I believe. Sorry, Sorry Anna. No worries. This is, the, this is the joy of being virtual. We can't really take those, um, those visual cues. So apologies there. So now we're going to talk a bit about phase two, which is really just starting to kick off. But what is really great, and you don't often get to say this, as, as seamlessly as we are able to, which is that we're able to really build off a lot of what was done in phase one to, to really kind of hone and focus the work that we're going to be doing with this next round of funding. So um, really kind of getting to see that high level work and, and bringing it down more to, to, the, to, you know, to the application. So um, maybe next slide, please. So, so talked about phase one, Build, and building on all that work that was done, we're gonna, and with the focus, of course, on Navy mission readiness and um, supporting the implementation and reliability of regionally significant transportation projects, we developed these three primary goals for the, this next phase of the grant, which are to, to you know, leverage what was, what was not built, leverage what was identified through the analysis done in that phase one and to determine really what is the feasibility of the projects at a high, you know, not so much up here, but really bringing it down and understanding what can we really do as far as options for um, key transportation facilities. And then what are the solutions? Um, you know, the climate, climate vulnerabilities um, have, have been kind of identified like we saw, saw, like we saw in that table. Um, but really, what does that mean um, from a cost perspective, from, again, kind of a feasibility perspective? And how do we go about doing that in, uh, in an organized and efficient, effective fashion? So really, you know, from, from that to then the data piece, which Rachel talked about just, just a minute ago and implementing that framework. And, and what does that mean? And how do we use you know, the data to really help drive these next steps and, and the implementation? So that's kind of, I'm gonna leave it there for a moment and I'm gonna hand it over to Anna Van. So two Annas, so that's not confusing at all, um, to walk through what, what the, the overall deliverables are. 
Thank you, Anna. Hello. Um, good morning, everyone. So for phase two of the grant, we will build upon and implement the analysis from phase one with a specific focus on the Pacific Coast Highway, Harbor Drive, and State Route 75, which are the identified strategic highway network connectors in the San Diego region. Um, some of those deliverables that we'll be working on is that we will continue our partner agency coordination from phase one and enhance collaboration with Navy partners to identify opportunities for transportation demand management incentives and partnerships. Um, we'll continue to include development of conceptual designs and high level cost estimates for site specific adaptation strategies. And we'll be integrating climate resilience considerations into the existing engineering project checklist to streamline resilience planning priorities that support mission readiness and transportation infrastructure improvements. And lastly, for the data piece, we will implement and validate the data sharing framework developed in phase one, which Rachel talked about, and continue working with our Navy partners for long-term data sharing opportunities. So there's gonna be a lot of good work to look forward to in phase two. And with that, I'll turn it back to Zach. Thanks, Anna. So with that timeline, um, we kind of have this put together. So as you can see, we started last summer uh, in 2020 when we were awarded the phase one grant. Um, and so far we've finalized the phase one report, which you can find in the attachments for this meeting, the summary for that. Um, and now we're starting phase two with our procurement um, and our kickoff meeting will be sometime in the next month or so. Um, and then as you can see, we're looking forward to the next year. We're gonna have our reports and recommendations in the first half of the year, our adaptation solutions design and development uh, coming a little bit later. And finally, our mitigation and TDM strategies identification, um, as well as our final quarter report, which should be finalized by next August. Um, so we're currently in the process of selecting a consultant to do all this work for us or with us um, uh, for, the, for this next phase. And then we have this timeline for the next year. And of course, we'll be coming back to the military working group over the next year uh, to provide updates to you all on how that's gonna go. And so our next steps, like I said, we're gonna wrap up the procurement for the second half of the grant. Um, and then we're gonna kick off the project and initiate our coordination. And we will be back soon with more updates as they are available. Um, and just as in a, if you need a point of contact, um, for our phase two project team going forward, uh, you can reach out to Anna Van or myself uh, here at Sandag. And of course we'll be coordinating with our partners at the Navy um, and throughout the region. Thank you everyone. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, let me go to public comment right away before I go to the working group members. Uh, are there any members of the public that would like to address this item? Or questions? Do you see any hands, Jennifer? I do see a hand. I'm searching to see who, whose hand it is. Okay. And if it is your hand up, go ahead and, and speak out if you'd like. Oh, it's Nicole Burgess. Nicole? Good morning, Jennifer Williamson. And thank you, Chair Bonelli. Uh, appreciate the time to make a comment on this. My name is Nicole Burgess. And for those of you who are new to this group, welcome. Um, I have been um, an active um, participant as a public commenter um, with the working group for several years, and it's good to see us back uh, meeting again, even though it's virtually. Um, so just real quick, just on this resilient plan, I want to thank staff, thank Sandag, because this is just super critical and really um, and really the, uh, a big component of the military working group is that it is such a, a huge uh, contributor to transportation mobility our economy. And so that's why I'm here. And um, just for reference, I am an active commuter. So I'm a big advocate for um, other modes of, of transportation. And just as um, this plan calls out, I just want to say thanks for highlighting some of these uh, climate stressors, sea level rise this is so critical. And, and, and as those last two topics were talked about, the Central Mobility Hub and the Comprehensive Multimodal Study, th this kind of uh, study is super critical to those kind of funding. So I appreciate all that, the data collection and the collaboration. Um, and just really want to stress that 
Water, water is, uh, it should be looked at as our asset, not as a liability. So um, looking at some of those three mentions, I think you mentioned Pack Highway and Harbor were just ones that really stuck out to me. And so just really thinking of Pacific Highway as this linear park that uh, captures our waters um, and manages it and then acts as a connectivity to really embrace the central part of our, our, our city. And that's where that central mobility is huge. So just wanted to kind of introduce myself and let you know that I think staff and uh, all, your, all hard, your hard work here and, and how critical it is that our Navy and Sandag are working together. And I thank you for that. So good to be, see you guys back in action. So thank you. Thank you for your comments, Nicole. Um, okay, on to working group members. Um, I want to give uh, uh, Navy Region Southwest, do you have anything you'd like to add right now? Thank you, Chair Bernelli. Um, I just want to acknowledge and applaud Sandak colleagues' hard work on phase one of OCC grant. Uh, they have coordinated and communicated with our Navy team, uh, specifically with the uh, base CPLOs throughout the, uh, this process, which is very much appreciated. And we look forward to working with Sandak on phase two of this effort as well. Uh, that's all I have to say, thank you. Thank you. Other working group members, I have a couple of questions in some direction, but I'll wait for other working group members. I have a question, Chair Benelli. Okay. Um, just wondering if we could hear a little bit more about how some of the cities that are hosts to our military installations and happy to be hosts, but how can we more specifically expect to be involved or how can we assist in this process? I know many of us either have or have underway our own sea level rise assessments and adaptation studies. So I'm wondering how, how is that looped in? Does that get looped in? What do you advise with respect to the host communities? Tina, an excellent question. Staff, you know, talk about local coastal plans, the LCPs that the, especially the five cities around the Bay have to deal with and their climate action plans as well as their uh, ways of dealing with sea level rise. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I, one thing we, we did not want to do was reinvent the wheel one or two in any way, shape or form, you know, Count, contradict or undermine any of the work that's already being done that is so critical and relevant um, specifically for your unique jurisdictions. And so the intent is to continue to leverage the work that is being done like, like we did for the first phase and continue to engage with the jurisdictions very closely to ensure that what it is that we are using is what you you know what you all have been working on already. So again, not reinventing the wheel. It's it's very important that we're consistent and we recognize that there's a lot of work being done, um, and we want to understand you know some of the assumptions that have gone into that and and understand you know from your jurisdictional perspective how how you got there so we can understand how we can all together move forward because it's going to impact everybody. So what is you know how are we able to um, continue to protect? you know, the, the very critical infrastructure, both from the Navy perspective, from the jurisdictional perspective as well, and that from a regional transportation perspective. Great, thank you. I really appreciate that. I know we have work underway here and I'm getting up to speed on that myself. So really happy to hear the coordinated and thank you for that presentation. Other questions or comments from working group members? Um, let me, maybe I missed it in the background information, but for phase two uh, with the DOD grant, what's the amount of dollars for the DOD grant? Uh, Chairman Lee, if I recall correctly, I believe it's around $800,000. $800,000? I believe so. Someone can correct me if that's inaccurate. And what I'd like staff to do when you figure out this is uh, important information and covers a good portion of our subregion here to uh, it'd be nice to get this, whether it's now or you think we wait till next summer, elevate the, uh, the results of this work to the full board of directors at, as an informational item. If I may, Mr. Chairman. Go ahead, Colleen, um, go ahead. Yeah, so um, excellent point. So there's two grants that we've received. And it's totally well over a million dollars. So I think what we can, we will definitely plan on once we get this, you know, 
wrapped up that we want to provide provide the final report to the board of directors. I think this is an incredible partnership that we've been able to leverage with the work we're already doing in these comprehensive multimodal areas and then building in resiliency both from an environmental perspective and obviously from a military perspective so we'd be happy to do that thank you colleague uh just as a a little uh vignette to go back we turn back the clock way back to 1976 uh there was a weather event called hurricane kathleen we don't get too many hurricanes and if they come through they usually pass through but hurricane kathleen in september of 1976 uh, came over the southern part of our region, stayed around for a while, just got, got stalled there. And I remember distinctly for Coronado and Imperial Beach, down at Emory Cove for a short time, the Pacific Ocean and the Bay actually met as one. And I do remember uh, going down at the time to the Boca Rio condominiums on, on the first street, right along the beach there, and the waves were going through the first floor condos and dumping into the Tijuana Slough. It was... Uh, an awesome display, an awesome yet scary display of mother nature. And that was in 1976. So, um, uh, you know, everything's about timing. If you get the right king tide with the uh, 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 right weather, uh, we can really uh, be in the hurt locker. And I, I know Imperial Beach has done extensive work with uh, uh, sea level rise in their, in their community. And anybody else comments or questions on this item? Thank you so much staff for this presentation. May I just make one final statement here, which is that um, the report will be posted to so the report that we were speaking about for phase one. We are going to be getting that posted online shortly. So um, when that gets up and running, we are happy to um, give the information to Jennifer so that she can send it out to the working group when it's when it's available. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Okay, we're on to our almost our last item here, uh, the update on the social equity early action transit pilot over to Brian Lane. Good morning, everyone. I'm bringing up my PowerPoint. Bear with me for one second. All right, hopefully you can see it. I hear, I see some nuts, perfect. Thank you. So I'm here to talk about the uh, social equity early action transit pilot that we've been working on. Um, I think at the beginning of our uh, present or the meeting today, the, our SANDAG social equity uh, statement, our commitment was being shown on our PowerPoint in English and in Spanish. Our board of directors approved that back in February. Um, and Hassan and board members and other uh, executives at Sandag have really taken this to heart and are trying to push as much as we can to consider social equity in all the planning that we do, all the projects that we're thinking of, and, and future projects that we're working on. And um, Hassan uh, has staff to work together with finance and with the transit operators and our stakeholders to uh, find some funding that we could work on a pilot that would advance some of the transit um, things that we've been hearing from our stakeholders over the years. Um, so we, we started meeting with our stakeholders and I'd like to give a, a special thanks to members and friends of the Sandag Social Equity Working Group. Uh, chair Moreno, Council Member Moreno from the city of San Diego is the chair of that working group. And there's uh, some of these folks are, are members of that group. And then some of them are some friends that aren't quite members, but uh, are are commonly attending these. And a few of these members uh, actually form a group called the San Diego Transportation Equity Working Group. And they had forwarded to us um, months ago, and we've been meeting with them generally monthly to discuss social equity and transportation. They forwarded <coughs> us uh, a, a list of items that they, they would like us to consider as we move forward with the regional plan and other projects that we work on. And so the social equity working group asked us to start meeting to discuss uh, how much funding we could get and what kind of projects that we could work on. And so the, these folks have been meeting with us every two weeks uh, since, since July uh, and have committed to meeting with, with us for every two weeks for the life of this project. And it's been a great working relationship, um, spending an hour, hour and a half every couple of weeks just discussing what we could work on, what we could look at in the future and consider. And so our finance folks came back to us and said they believe 
we could move about eight million dollars to, uh, towards this pilot project. Uh, so we started working together to understand and decide what we would like to um, the board to consider at, for this project. And so we, and I'm going to go into each of these a little bit uh, briefly. But youth fairs about a six million dollars, transit improvements about one point seven five million dollars, education and outreach through our CBOs about two hundred thousand dollars, and then a research study to show the benefits for about fifty thousand dollars. So our board was asked to consider an amendment for the current fiscal year budget of $2.13 million. And the, the balance of that budget would be included in our FY23 and 24 budgets um, as we move forward with those budget items. The funding that finance folks told us they were gonna uh, use was gonna uh, be the CMAC, the Congestion Mitigation and Air Quality Improvement Program funds. They're uh, telling us that they're just repurposing some funds that either weren't spent because of COVID and slowdowns on various programs or some other projects that have just been pushed out for other reasons um, for into a year or two in the future. So that's the funding that we're looking to work at. And that works, obviously, any transit projects generally is, is meeting the goals of CMAC. Um, when you're get, getting folks out of cars or future riders out of cars and into transit, you know, you're obviously helping to support investments that encourage alternatives to driving alone. So the concepts, like I talked about, the, the big one was the free fare for youth. Uh, the, the stakeholders, the CBOs, and the social, uh, the transportation equity working group folks have been asking for, for years and years that we start considering uh, a youth opportunity, um, YOP, why can I remember the P? Youth opportunity program that provides free fares for youth 24 and under, um, that you know, getting, obviously, the more folks you can get um, on the transit and start using transit today. It maybe is a, a person you get for life. A lot of these folks generally, you know, don't have a lot of money as you, as you leave your parents' house and start going to school or get a job, you may not have a lot of money, but you need a, a transportation and you need a reliable transportation. And they've always been asking us to consider that as a free fare for those folks. Um, the, the problem with that and with this pilot is that we've, estimated that to be about $35 million a year. Um, if you add in the 18 to 24 year old range of riders, because once you turn 18, you do start paying the full fare on transit. And that is that does make up about a quarter of our ridership. So it is a significant fare uh, revenue stream for both operators. So for the pilot, our stakeholders, um, while they you know always ask us to keep considering the 24 and under in the future and the regional plan and other work we do, they did, they did agree that the 18 and under was a great way to move forward with this pilot for the next year. So we estimate that to be about $6 million a year using our pre-COVID data from FY 2019. That's how much revenues the MTS and NCTD took in from youth. And so to make their budgets whole, we would reimburse them for those funds. Some other considerations are, are right, ensuring that we do reimburse MTS and NCTD for any lost revenue that they would get. And then if there's any, um, spikes in demand on some trips, um, you know, we'd have to make sure that we do add some extra trips on a couple of routes if that does happen and how we would fairly reimburse them for that. So the speaking of adding trips, uh, we've heard from historically underserved areas and our, our folks in the stakeholder groups that they're, um, you know, the more transit you have, uh, the, the more trips that come per hour on routes, the better um, they can ride transit and not have to drive their car or, or buy a car that you know they may not be able to afford. So they asked us to look into adding trips in some of these historically underserved areas that could help uh, the folks that live there. We realized that we can't, um, for now in the short-term pilot, add trips during the peaks, during the weekdays, because both transit agencies actually have pretty much all their buses out in the system at that point already. So to, to add trips during that, those times, you'd have to actually buy via, more vehicles and, and hire a lot more drivers. So we realized that that's not something we could do with the pilot, but we did start looking at uh, late, at, late night trips on weekdays and on weekends when service starts you know, slowing down and there's not as many trips. And they've identified, identified those trips frequently as the ones that they wish the transit operators would add more service to. Because at those late at night, if there's less trips, or on the weekends when there's less trips, a person may just not be able to take transit because they can't get home from their job or from their, their um, church or, or whatever uh, 
thing they're doing at that time. So we started looking into some of the routes in these areas and I've listed these routes and I won't get into the weeds of those, but the, the folks thought these were some good routes and um, services that we could improve. So we're gonna continue to really dig into the weeds on these over the next couple months with our group to figure out wh exactly which trips we would like MTS and NCTD to consider to improve service on. Uh, there are other, some other routes as well that are, are being considered. And we've been hearing from some uh, transportation committee and board members that they would like us to consider um, working with microtransit, maybe to provide more trips to, you know, as first mile, last mile options. Uh, but our, our stakeholder group, again, we considered those types of um, options with the pilot. But those folks, you know, in our, a lot of our meetings really felt that just focusing some key improvements on a few routes would be the best use of the funds for this pilot. And, you know, they asked that as we consider moving forward on other pilots with out of that come out of the regional plan or with other funding that we get, those are the types of things that we would consider moving forward in the future. Another big thing we heard was, you know, a lot of folks just don't even know much about transit sometimes. Um, if, if you're, you know, just becoming age or you're moving to the area, you may not know a, a lot about the current transit system. Or if we do a new youth free fare, we think they want to make sure that the word gets out, that the Pronto fare card gets into the hands of the youth and people know about the extra services. So they've asked us to um, set aside a bit of funds to help spread the word about both the pilot efforts and transit in general. So we would take this pot of funds and divvy them out to some of our CBOs who already have a lot of experience working with us and the transit operators on doing outreach and marketing. Uh, another part of this funds would be uh, a research study to demonstrate the benefits. So we would come back to the transportation committee and the board and MTS and NCTD boards to show the, um, how the pilot went. And the idea is, you know, that uh, obviously a pilot is to show what you could, a small portion of, when you have a small part of funds, um, you know, if there are benefits, then that that's, gives you the impetus to move forward with the, doing that for a long-term kind of a solution. So we'll come back with qualitative and quantitative data on that as well. So with our, our timeline, the Social Equity Working Group uh, unanimously approved these pilot recommendations at their September 23rd meeting. The Transportation Committee uh, also unanimously approved that the board um, move forward with these at their October 1st meeting. I went to the Board of Directors last Friday, um, although we had hoped it would be a unanimous vote. Uh, so some board members felt that um, we weren't going far enough and they wanted us to do a whole lot more. I'm not sure they quite understood that we had limited funds with this pilot, but uh, we didn't get a unanimous vote, but we did get it passed and we will move forward with this. Uh, the regional plan hopefully will be adopted in December and that will help um, guide us forward on, you know, getting narrowing down the details and how we can move forward. Uh, the free youth fairs would likely start next March as we move forward, moving the funding and working with MTS and NCTD on MOUs to reimburse them for that. The education and outreach would start a month or so before that to help start getting the word out. The transit service increases wouldn't start until next September because um, we, like I said, we're still working on the details of which trips. So once we finalize that over the coming month or so, we would then forward that to MTS and NCTD uh, so they could work on their scheduling and get that out to their drivers. The pilot would end uh, a June after that and we would then start getting the research results available soon after. So with that, Chair, I thank you for your time and be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Brian. That's the third time I've heard that presentation. You I, do got job of, of making it. Uh, let me first go to members of the public. Do you, uh, any members of the public have a question of Brian regarding this transit pilot? Uh, Anybody, Chair Benelli, we do have a, a comment. Nicole, is your hand still up or do you want to comment on this as well? Uh, actually, I would love to make a quick comment on Perfect. this. And thank, yeah. you. thank you, Jennifer. Um, and thank you, Brian Lane and staff for the, all your hard work on the social equity early action pilot project. It is super exciting to see youth opportunity passes and it's ex extremely valuable for transit and increasing ridership and, and encouraging lifelong transit users. So, and I understand the limitations and it's uh, under 18, um, but getting it up to 24 years old, actually, transit free for everybody is really a great thing for Sandag to start uh, working on. But for that 24 and under, I, I just, I really just think big of about this working group, military 
um, as a lot of your enlisted folks are under 24. So how can the military work to actually help, um, help this effort? Because so many of those individuals could actually um, decrease their uh, dependency on cars. And so thinking of the TDM, um, is there ever an option for paid parking on your bases? Um, it, what does that transportation demand management look like? Shuttles to Point Loma used to be a thing. Now all the individual cars still come through our neighborhoods. Um, just, you know, really thinking about that. And then as education and, and, and military and, and Sandag staff, you know, shifting it, education is important, but really having some incentives. So how can we incentivize a healthy incentive commuter program um, to encourage people to take transit, to consider them to how to get that last mile um, by bike or foot um, is going to be super extremely valuable. So I think uh, Sandake for all their hard work on this, just extremely important to that you're listening to the community and making those improvements to the to those frequent bus lines and even those late hours. So I got to catch a late hour trolley line the other night and it's super helpful. So thank you again to staff. Thank you for your comments, Nicole. Uh, comments from any of the working group members. Okay. Uh, Brian, let me just say off, off the top of my head, uh, are you aware of any uh, metropolitan area in the United States that does have totally free transit, public transit? Uh, free for everybody. There's no major or medium sized or major sized uh, transit agency yet that is doing that. Some have started um, researching it. There are a few very small agencies and small like Midwest towns that started transit and just said, you know, just rather than buy fare boxes, let's just make it free. So they've done it and they're, they're finding it fairly successful, but you know, they, like I said, they started with that. So their budgets already, you know, considered that transit or fair revenues wouldn't be a part of their equation. So it's easier for them, but there are many agencies doing various um, either for free youth or free low income. Uh, uh, these are popping up left and right over the last year or so um, they're, we're seeing more and more of these popping up. Muni in San Francisco used to do a free low income for youth. And then about a month and a half ago, made it free for all youth, like we're considering. So um, that just started and I think they're seeing positive results, but it, like it's very brand new. So we're looking forward to seeing the results of that. I think a couple agencies on the East Coast, uh, Boston is working on a free youth as well. And we've been hearing uh, rumors of a few other working on, on parts of it, but not the whole. The whole system yet. Good, good. I, I know my my only uh, experience is uh, in micro tra in, uh, micro transit form is in a very uh, affluent uh, choice riders in Mammoth Lakes, California. Ski season, the buses run pretty frequently, and they're totally free. So it's uh, it's a good deal. Yeah. Uh, and easily okay, good. Um, okay, any other questions regarding this item? Okay, seeing or hearing none. I'm oh, going I to see it. I do see hand raised, Chair. You do, okay. Uh, Captain Franklin, I believe. Yeah, hey, good morning. And uh, thank you for having me. Uh, as the Installation Commanding Officer for Naval Base Point Loma, uh, I appreciate any efforts that are dedicated towards transportation of these sailors. As previously mentioned, a lot of these sailors don't even have vehicles. And this has been one of my uh, hot button topics since I've been the Installation CEO for the last year. And unfortunately, there's not a lot of good solutions. Uh, Uber and Lyft do not prefer to come out to the submarine base because quite honestly, it's just not worth their time or, or effort or money because uh, they, they may come out here to pick up one fare while they can go back and forth between Old Town and Downtown and the airport and collect probably three, fare, three fares uh, during the time it would take, you know, picking up one sailor at the submarine base, unfortunately. So uh, Uber and Lyft is not a good solution. Uh, taxis are an another alternative, but that, that tends to be a little bit costly more than Uber and Lyft. And then public transportation is not really a great option because they can't get onto the installation. And for us, I will tell you where the barracks are, uh, where the dorms are for these sailors at its submarine base. It's, it's about a 1.2 mile walk just to get to the front gate. So unfortunately, Right now, there's not a lot of good solutions. One of the things that used to uh, apparently be pretty successful uh, was the jump bikes, but for some reason that went away. Um, and we've seen the scooters, uh, that, that's another option, but I, I will tell you, uh, I did have a sailor get, get hurt, uh, busted a, 
uh, bust himself up pretty bad running over the back of a vehicle backing out of a, a, a driveway a few months back. So not exactly the safest alternative. So any efforts to improve transportation for these young sailors, I, I would be happy to kind of get involved with that discussion, that effort. My team, I know Muska Like, she's been a big advocate of this and talking about it with the community planning, planning group. So, you know, again, thank you for that. Uh, and anything we can do, uh, would really appreciate the, the help there, over. Captain, I appreciate your comments. And one of the things uh, that the Port of San Diego, working with SANDAC, uh, as the port updates their master plan, we're trying to implement a much more robust ferry system, essentially spider web throughout the bay. So if uh, on your base, if a sailor lives in National City or Chula Vista, they may have, you know, get, if they can get to the bay, get to the bay they might be able to get on a, a pretty good ferry and get to your base uh, sometime in the future back and forth. So we, the port's definitely pushing hard on trying to get a, uh, essentially a, a spider web, if you will, of th commuter ferries uh, throughout the bay, uh, running a good portion of the day. Other comments on the, other comments on the transfer pilot. Okay, hearing none. Okay, we're down to uh, almost a German, so I'm going to get to any anything else. Any uh, for the good of the order, good for the good of the working group. And any working members have any other comments or information they'd like to share or questions? Okay, hearing none. Our next meeting right now is tentatively scheduled for Monday, the sixth of December. Uh, Jennifer Williamson as our clerk, or Colleen Clemenson. Uh, do you have any other things you'd like to add for the good of the group? No, I, I don't right now. So um, yeah, we'll look forward to that meeting on December 6th and okay. give you updates then. Okay, thank you everybody for your time this morning. I really appreciate it. And hopefully this information is useful to you and your respective communities and commands. Take care and have a good day. Bye everyone.